Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. This is March 3rd, 2020. And this is video number 23 of my series called The Mystery of the Beast. Today's video is called The Prophecies of Isaiah. And I'm going to begin going through eight chapters from the book of Isaiah, beginning with chapter 42. And as I read through this, I will relate it to the things that you've learned in the previous videos. I'm going to try to move along at a fairly quick pace and not explain everything. So it will really be valuable to you if you go back and listen to my videos review them or listen to them for the first time because I'm going to be using principles and ideas that I introduce in those videos, many of which uh, you will not be used to unless you have been listening to my teaching. So chapter 42 of Isaiah begins, Behold my servant, by the way, I use the English Standard Version. I think it's a great version of the Bible, and I often will go to another version um, to check on some interpretations. King James Version is often helpful. Verse, or chapter 42. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I've put my spirit upon him, he will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Most people when they read that, they think of Jesus, and rightly so, because first and foremost, this is a prophecy concerning Jesus. But it is not limited to Jesus. This is a prophecy that also deals with the Kodeshim. And I've spoken of the Kodeshim in many of my previous videos. The word Kodeshim means holy ones. And Another word that you find in the scripture for the Kodeshim is the word overcomer. And you find that in the book of Revelation. Actually, it turns out in the English Standard Version, it always says, to him who conquers, I will give such and such. The Lord says that to them. So a conqueror or an overcomer. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. So it's not that overcomers or Kodeshim are somehow superhuman people who um, <clears throat> can simply obey God better than anyone else. A lot of Kodeshim, for example, um, I believe would not get involved with a lot of um, harsh bodily practices like um, perhaps a lot of fasting or a lot of separation, uh, being alone, getting up on a pillar, like you heard of people in the ancient days of the church who would, who believed that to separate themselves in such a way would purge them of all sin that they might have in their flesh. Well, I can tell you that, and Paul told you that that has nothing to do with helping you get rid of the sin, sinful nature in your flesh. You're going to carry that until the day you die. Or hopefully until the day you're glorified, because my hope is that I will be glorified before I die in my flesh. But this sinful nature that we live in is something that we have to deal with daily. In fact, that's what it means. That's what Jesus means when he says, take up your cross daily and follow me. My cross is the 
burden of the flesh that I bear. It's the burden of being imperfect that I bear. And I can't make it on my own. And I have to fully recognize that. And I can only overcome by the blood of Jesus Christ and by the word of my testimony. I will, I will say that I believe and I trust in Jesus until the end. That's just the way it is. And that's the way it is for any person who is faithful to the Lord. 42 verse 5. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it, in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, The Lord God has called us in righteousness, and he's called us to be righteous. John says, be holy as the Lord is holy. And everyone who has this hope in himself practices righteousness. And so God has called us in righteousness, and he's called us to practice righteousness. We practice it, but... We can't fulfill it. We can't be perfect in it yet, but we will be. Now look at verse 6 again. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. The new covenant has not fully come yet, even though most Christians believe that it has. But this 2,000 year period of time that we are now coming to the very end of since the time that Jesus Christ walked the earth, that was the time for God to prepare, to call out and prepare his Kodeshim. God is going to give his Kodeshim as a covenant for the nations. It is going to be the Kodeshim who bring in the fullness of the new covenant of God. Now, I had not intended to to do this, but I think it's important for you to understand this. Let's go to John chapter 17. John chapter 17 is a, it's called the high priestly prayer, and it's amazing, and we need to understand what it's about. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Notice that Jesus puts himself in the same sentence. I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. He's speaking of the Kodeshim here. Let's continue. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. 
I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Notice that. This is key. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Now let's continue to go on with this to understand what he meant by that. All mine are yours and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. See, Christ will be glorified in the Kodeshim, in the Holy Ones. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them. I have guarded them. And not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. The Kodeshim are guarded. The Kodeshim are predestined to achieve their calling. But now I am coming to you. And these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Now, has God given his word to you? Has the word of the Lord been revealed to you? I was only 21 years old when the word of the Lord was revealed to me, and it was a, a supernatural, incredible experience that changed my life. I was never the same again after that. And it's been a process since then of growing in the word and of following the Lord throughout my life. It's now been almost 43 years, almost exactly 43 years now. The word of the Lord has to be revealed to a person in order for the new birth to occur within a person because you have to be begotten of the word of God in order to become a new man. Many, many people, many, many people in the world and in our churches say that they are Christians. But many of them have not had the word of the Lord revealed to them yet. The 2,000 year period of time that we are now coming to the end of was the time of God implanting his word in particular people that were foreknown by God. Foreknown. Does that mean that we had a pre-existence with God just as Jesus did before the foundation of the earth? I don't know the answer to that question. To Jeremiah, God said, before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. Did Jeremiah have a pre-existence that was before the creation of the world? I don't know. Verse 14 again. This is John 17, verse 14. I have given them your word. This is Jesus speaking, praying to God, and he's talking about his disciples right now. And he includes everyone except for Judas who betrayed him. He gave them his word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world. If you have received the word of the Lord, this is a test. 
This is how you can know that you've received the word of the Lord because the world will have hated you. You will not have fitted in or you will not have fit in to the world. You were always the odd man out. You couldn't sit there and watch the movie that your parents brought over to your house when you were raising children because there were things in the movie that you didn't want your children to see or things that you yourself didn't even want to see. The world cannot understand the person, the man or the woman, who has received the word of the Lord from Jesus. The world will hate you. You don't even have to say anything. It's, they think you're condemning them simply because of the way that you are or the way that you raised your children, somehow it provokes them and makes them feel guilty because it's truth. And they don't want that truth. They don't want to receive that truth. It's too holy for them. The word of God is holy. And the word of God cannot be received by the world at this time. Verse 14 again, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Okay, so Jesus, do you think that his prayer went unanswered? Of course not. Of course God answered Jesus' prayer. So God kept the Kodeshim, the disciples of Christ that were alive at this time when Jesus was praying. God kept them from the evil one and they were successful in their calling. They accomplished everything that God gave them to do. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. That means set them apart in the truth. Your word is truth. <clears throat> Read Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is all about the word of God being the truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself. For their sake, I set myself apart, that they also may be set apart in truth. Now listen to this, verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Twenty. Again, I do not ask for these only, the disciples, the 11 disciples. I don't ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. The disciples, the apostles, wrote the scripture, and the scripture that they wrote was the word of God. The Spirit breathed his word into them and through them, and they wrote it on paper. And I am one of those people who believed in Christ through their word. The goal was that we may all be one, okay? And also, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. We are now coming to the time in history where the world is finally going to believe. We're not there yet. We've never been there yet. The world has not believed. The world has been the domain of Satan until now. 
The government of Satan has ridden the beast, has ridden man for these 6,000 years of creation. And Satan has ruled the world until now. But now we see that the kingdom of Satan has been divided. The division is the great divorcement of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which often in the Bible is called the great apostasy. The great apostasy or the great divorcement, the great rift in the kingdom of Satan revealed the lawless one. Who is the lawless one? The lawless one is man. Mankind is lawless. President Trump rebelled against Babylon the Great, the spiritual entity, the spiritual principle that has ruled the world for 6,000 years, threw Babylon the Great off of his back. And that's why the deep state, Babylon the Great, has been so angry, even calling for his murder. Jesus prophesied that a kingdom divided cannot stand. Satan's kingdom has now been divided and it cannot stand. Many people see President Trump as a savior and as a righteous man, but he isn't yet. He isn't yet. He still speaks. He still speaks like an unsaved man. One to whom the word of the Lord has not yet been revealed. But he is fighting against Babylon the Great. And with the help of God, he will destroy Babylon the Great. Well, how is God going to give him that help? I believe that that help is going to come through the Kodashim. Donald Trump is a mortal man. He cannot fight against the spiritual entities that wage war against him in the flesh. He has to have spiritual help. That spiritual help comes in the form of the Kodashim. The Kodashim, the Holy Ones of God, are about to be revealed and they will empower Trump to totally defeat Babylon the Great. Now, Revelation 17 says that that Donald Trump, well, it says that the eighth head of the beast fights against the lamb, but that the lamb will destroy him by the breath of his mouth. Well, that means by his word. So the word of God is coming to the eighth head of the beast. The word of God will come to and will bring salvation to Donald Trump and to all those with him, all those who have come out of Babylon See, there's two, there's two significant calls that we have to understand. The first call is the call to come out of Babylon. Many, many people are still in Babylon that should not be there. People who say that they are believers in Jesus Christ and who believe in righteous things. They still hold on to many of the deceptions of Babylon the Great. They still, for example, call themselves Democrats and they still vote Democrat for people who will murder babies in the womb up to the time of birth and perhaps afterwards because they will not vote for uh, the new Keep Alive, Keep the Baby Alive bill that if a baby from an abortion is born alive that a doctor should do everything it can to save its life. But They do not support that. Democrats do not support that. But a lot of Christians still support Democrats, still are Democrats. How can you be a Democrat and be a Christian? 
How can you support the kingdom of Satan and be a Christian? The call is still going out. Come out of Babylon, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you share in her plagues. That call. But there's another call too. Do not take the mark of the beast. See, Trump is the eighth head of the beast. And the beast has turned against its master. The beast has turned against the harlot that rode him and now seeks to destroy that harlot, that deep state. And there are people who support the beast, and I'm one that does, and you need to read the, the prayer of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 to understand the prayer of a righteous man who serves a king that God has called. And also the way that Daniel answers Nebuchadnezzar in um, Daniel chapter 4, you will see the same attitude toward the reigning monarch, the one that God has raised up. But the mark of the beast is the mark of doing things man's way and not God's way. Man's laws rule in, in the heart of the man who takes the mark of the beast, not God's law. But one of the things that you will consistently see in the scripture with respect to the Kodeshim is that they honor God's law. Go to Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. And I think we'll go to that in a, a minute here. Let me open it up and then I'm going to finish this from John chapter 17. Okay. Let's uh, finish up John chapter 17, starting at verse 20 again. I do not ask for these only. I'm not praying only for the disciples that are here in my presence, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. They'll, those disciples wrote the scriptures, the New Testament, and we have believed in Christ through their word that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So the time is coming when the Kodeshim now are going to bring the word of God to the entire earth. That ties back to what I was reading from Isaiah chapter 42. I will give you Kodeshim, as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind. The world is blind. To bring out the prisoners from the dungeon. Even though Jesus has died for the sins of all men, those men still, most men still sit in a dungeon with the door open because they don't understand that the door has been opened for them. To bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness, the world still wallows in the darkness of sin and unbelief. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other. Nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. He is doing that right now. God is declaring a new thing. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. God is telling his people now that a new thing is about to happen. This is 
just as new of a thing as what happened 2,000 years ago when Christ was crucified and resurrected. What is about to happen is huge. So now back to John 17. I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. And so here, this is Jesus asking that the Kodeshim be allowed to be glorified as well because we cannot see him as he is until we are like him. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. So this is chapter 17 of the book of John. They rightly call it the high priestly prayer, the prayer of Melchizedek. This is Jesus's prayer for the Kodeshim, for those whom God will glorify in his presence. These are the ones Isaiah speaks of in chapter 8. For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. And do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And he, the Lord of hosts, will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So Jesus became a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling. This is a prophecy concerning Jesus. To both houses, that's the northern kingdom, the northern kingdom which came to represent the church and the southern kingdom, which was Judah, who even today still represents the Jews. So we have the Jews and then we have the northern kingdom of Israel known as Ephraim, the main tribe there. And Ephraim prophetically speaks of the church or those who call themselves the church. But notice that he, the Lord of hosts, Jesus, becomes a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses. J Jesus would not be accepted in most churches in the world. J the word of Christ is a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to those who call themselves by his name because most of the church does not walk in his way. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. And then, verse 16, bind up the testimony. Seal the teaching among my disciples. Notice here in footnote G, it's the word law. And I like other translations that actually use the word law because it's not just the teaching, it is the law. The law and the testimony. Bind up the testimony. The testimony is the historical record of God, which is contained in the Bible. Seal the law among my disciples. So the disciples, these are the same disciples that 
Jesus is praying for in John chapter 17 and all of those who believe through them and including Isaiah and those who believed through the Old Testament prophets, all of the disciples hold to the testimony of God as found in the scriptures and to the law of God. Verse 17, I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob and I will hope in him. Now, the house of Jacob, that is all of Israel. That's the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The 12 tribes of Israel, Jacob became Israel. God has hidden his face from these people because they have walked in disobedience. Now look at 18. Behold, I, Christ, Jesus Christ, and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. Isn't that interesting? These children... These are the ones that Jesus just prayed for in John chapter 17. The children that God gives and has given to Jesus are the disciples who have lived in all the times past and who are alive today. These people, along with Jesus... are signs and portents. They are prophetic indicators, prophetic beings in Israel, in the people of God, because Israel is all the people of God. And they're from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. Mount Zion is the habitation of God. And we actually are to become that habitation. <coughs> and when they say to you, people say, when people say, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter. In other words, go to, go to the false prophets Go to those whom the world recognizes as people who really know what's going on. Okay, these are those who follow Satan, of course. So when they say to you, go to that kind of a person to find out what's going on, should not a people inquire of their God? Of course we should. We don't go to mediums and we don't go to necromancers. And we don't go to witches and we don't go to warlocks and we don't go to palm readers or anything like that. Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? Of course not. To the law and to the testimony. Verse 20, to the teaching. The teaching is the word law. To the law and to the testimony. If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. Or they have no light. This is how you know an overcomer. This is how you know a Kodashim. Do they speak according to the word? Do they speak according to the law? Do they speak according to the testimony? If they do not, then they have no light within themselves. Such a person, verse 21, they will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against the king and their God and turn their faces upward. And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish. And they will be thrust into thick darkness. Thick darkness, the outer darkness. This is talking about now. And then chapter 9, believe it or not, 
is another chapter that actually speaks of the Kodeshim. And I think we'll go ahead and go there just so you see this in context. So we'll go to Isaiah 9. Because don't let the Bible break you up with respect to how to understand it because it goes directly from 8 ending talking about the people who are the signs and portents of God. And then we have this thick darkness and then pr probably well, one of the most, uh, one of the greatest uh, chapters of the Bible comes up. <clears throat> one of the great chapters that Handel used in the Messiah. Chapter nine, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. Her who was in anguish. She is about to give birth, this one who was in anguish. There will be no gloom for her. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. First, of course, this happened in that small region in Judea and north of there in the land of Galilee. And this was when Jesus came. All of these people walked in darkness and they saw the great light of Christ. And of course, this is First and foremost, speaking of Jesus Christ and the prophecy of his coming. Verse 3, you have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. This has not occurred yet. All of us still live under the burden of the oppressor. The time is at hand when the rod of the oppressor is going to be broken from us. For every boot of the tromping warrior and battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This has not occurred yet. The child that was born first was Jesus. He was the firstborn from the dead. But there is another child about to be born. And believe it or not, this child is also going to be called the firstborn. This firstborn child is going to be, going to consist of the Kodeshim, of all the Kodeshim. All of the glorified holy ones And as we continue to read in this prophecy of Isaiah that I began this video with today, Isaiah chapters 42 to 49, this is going to become more and more clear. And it's going to even become clear as to how this is worked out in history because it's, it's extremely profound the way that all of this has worked out. The government of God 
is coming. The kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom of God has not ruled the earth yet. The kingdom of Satan has ruled this world for 6,000 years. Satan's kingdom is now divided. Satan's kingdom is coming to an end. The man of lawlessness has been revealed and, as Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Lord cannot come until you see this happen. It has happened. So the Lord can now come. But when he comes, it will not look like what people think it will look like. That's why this word is coming out now. So that those who should know and need to know will know. The time is at hand when the government of God is going forth. Of the increase of that government and of the peace of that government, there will be no end. This kingdom is going to be established with justice and with righteousness. Justice and righteousness. Kodeshim, the holy ones, the righteous ones, the just ones are coming. The time is at hand.